Hello, Penguinauts! I'm the Beardy Penguin, and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program Beyond Kerbal! In the last episode, we fetched our four Kerbonauts from the Akira mobile base on the surface of the wasteland, and we brought them back up to Constellation, which is now heading on back home to Solitude, powered by its rather beautiful open cycle nuclear engine, as you can see just there. We had to do two passes uh, around our periapsis to complete this burn, but it was really rather painless, and we're back on our way home. It turns out we calculated the amount of supplies and the amount of fuel we needed for this mission really rather well, so I'm quite happy with how this whole thing turned out, because this whole mission was uh, a brainchild of this actual series, was going and testing uh, a few more colonization tools and the like, building that mobile base, and also getting some data that we needed from the surface of our old homeworld, and more importantly, from the remnants of the old Kerbal Space Center, buried far underneath the R&D Center. But anyway, get a rather beautiful shot of it leaving the wasteland there, and most likely it is the last time we will ever see our homeworld, at least for a very, very long time. So now we're out into deep space, what we're going to do is transmit the science that we've uh, been researching and get ready to do a maneuver. But we've transmitted quite a lot of science back, not only from Constellation, but also from Morningstar. So we can research artificial intelligence, specialized photovoltaic materials, extreme fuel storage, exotic radiators, experimental photovoltaic materials, experimental electrical systems, specialized plasma propulsion, extreme nuclear propulsion, and exotic fusion rockets. Yeah, we researched a lot of stuff. We have a lot of science. Um, we go through quite a lot of time in this episode. And of course, Morningstar has got three separate science labs all churning out science. So yeah, we go through quite a few years of time in this, uh, in this episode. And as such, we produce a lot of science and almost actually complete the tech tree. You can see they're just completing a bit of a course change maneuver to make sure we've got a nice low periapsis around solitude and now we are returning home after about 270 days or so of travel. Really not too long a trip, if you remember Morningstar got launched near the end of the previous series and they are still way out in the edge of the solar system and they've got a probably rather unexpected mission extension since we weren't originally planning to go to Eltos and that is going to add a lot of time onto their mission, but uh, more about that later. So you can see here now we are returning to Solitude. We have to actually make sure we're pointing the engine away from the atmosphere because I kind of forgot, yeah, this is an open cycle nuclear engine. So the exhaust is actually highly radioactive because parts of the reactor fuel actually get mixed directly with the propellant. So you don't really want to be firing that directly at your home world's atmosphere for fear of actually irradiating the planet. Uh, some people have pointed out in my Discord that using this even in orbit around my home planet will be uh, <laughs> spewing radioactive filth into the low orbit around the planet. But, uh, well, hopefully it's not going to be too much uh, <laughs> of a concern. And also, I mean, once the Constellation crew descend back down to the surface, it's going to be quite a long time before any Kerbals even set foot, I'm going to say set foot, well even travel into low orbit around solitude. Uh, so hopefully during that time some of the radioactive waste might have dissipated. But anyway, just performing uh, one last little burn just to circularize our orbit into a nice low orbit around solitude so that we can send a spacecraft up to come and pick up our motley crew. Eight Kerbonauts in total who have all gone and visited our fallen homeworld and are probably now looking forward to some shore leave because they didn't have any cryonic freezing bays like those lucky buggers over on Morningstar so they had to twiddle their thumbs during both the outward bound and the return journeys. Anyway, this is the vehicle that we are sending up to pick them up. It's called the Condor and it is completely 100% fusion powered. Multi-stage rockets are now a thing of the past. I mean, we're probably still <laughs> going to use them for exceptionally heavy payloads, but just for crew transportation, our fusion power technology is now more than advanced enough to warrant building SSTO spacecraft that take off vertically much like a traditional rocket. So what this is actually using is a magnetized target fusion reactor. Now we've had this technology for a little while but up until very recently it wasn't all that feasible as SSTO propulsion as the Sabre engine did a much much better job. But since we've got all of our upgrades it's now more than feasible. So the way, the way magnetized target fusion sort of works is a combination of magnetic confinement and inertial confinement fusion. So you keep the fusion 
fusion fuel at a low density confined with magnetic fields and then you sort of do a pulsed uh, compression of the fusion fuels just igniting fusion for a few seconds well a few nanoseconds at a time um, and there are a few different ways of doing that I believe there's one rather innovative design that uses a liquid metal actually around the fusion fuel and compresses that and the liquid metal is heated up and then tapped off so you can actually get a lot of thermal energy out of the reactor and that is the main benefit of this reactor design is that it produces a lot of thermal energy all the other fusion reactors we have access to they produce a lot of power but it's in the form of charged particles so yes it produces a lot of electricity very 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 good for generating electricity and powering plasma engines or any kind of electrical engine but if we want to be bringing in at the atmosphere like we're doing passing it through a reactor and expelling it out the back really not all that helpful so that's where the magnetized target fusion reactor comes in it produces a lot more power for how much it weighs than any of our respective fission reactors and as such we are able to use it to get ourselves up into orbit now we only actually used the planet's atmosphere for the first 10 kilometers or so and then the atmosphere got thin enough that we had to switch over to our internal fuel supply. Turns out that the best propellant for this actual application is liquid carbon dioxide. Uh, it just about had uh, just the correct balance of high thrust and also very high uh, specific impulse and so the best sort of balance of the two of all the available pellets uh, to get us up and into a low orbit. I believe it had about a thousand kilonewtons of thrust when passed through this thermal uh, turbojet and also about 500 seconds of specific impulse so more than enough to get us into low orbit and rendezvous us with the constellation. See that massive rather beautiful 3.75 meter uh, command pod at the top is added by near future launch vehicles which we added just for this series because I was rather tired of having to use really tiny little command modules especially for all the massive spacecraft we're building and that we plan to build in the future. But anyway we transfer all of our constellation crew across and then we go and shut down all the various systems all the life support agroponics and the like we don't need it to be activated anymore so after we've transferred across the crew and all of our scientific experiments it's time to undock and head down towards the surface getting a really gorgeous IVA view there of the constellation as we depart. I had a few requests to uh, include a few more IVA views and they really are beautiful uh, at select moments during the game. So now we can head on back down to the surface. Now this spacecraft doesn't have any heat shielding uh, but it is going to re-enter not like an SSTO plane but very much like a normal capsule so it's going to go rear end first and just survive uh, the atmospheric entry just using a blunt body effect uh, and crossing their fingers but no I mean the re-entry heating isn't particularly uh, wild when you're in a relatively low orbit like we are uh, so it's not too much to worry about it's only really the fuel tanks that we use to contain our liquid carbon dioxide that have any kind of problem and you see there yeah uh, one of them explodes early on in the re-entry process which really freaked me out I, I did have a look at the maximum temperatures of most of our components and it was more than enough to survive a rather gentle re-entry like this uh, but unfortunately yeah I didn't check the fuel tanks they have much much lower tolerance I mean they're storing cryogenic fuel after all uh, and yeah for some reason the top one explodes but the bottom one doesn't so I, I don't really know why that is uh, maybe we should protect them a little better in future just a little note to self but the wonder of this fusion design is yeah this is an SSTO all I have to do is blast up into orbit grab the crew and it heads straight back down so it's fully reusable and once it's in the atmosphere actually has effectively infinite fuel because we're just passing the atmosphere through the reactor core heating it up and expelling it out the back so now we're back down into the lower atmosphere we can correct our trajectory and pretty much land exactly on top of the space center and get a hundred percent of our funds back for this vehicle so for a first test drive I didn't think this was too shabby we'll almost certainly be using a variation or an evolution of this design in future when we're sending our colonists down to the surface of foreign in fact alien uh, world so I think that's really rather exciting but we get about 9,000 science just from recovering all the experiments that's in addition to all of the science that our science labs produced over the duration of the mission and using that we're going to grab ourselves exotic electrical systems most of the technologies we're grabbing now are just upgrade tech so they're just upgrading all of our existing power generation uh, and electrical engines and all that fancy stuff we're not using most of these but the upgrades are free once you've researched the tech so uh, we're just going to make sure we unlock all of those 
So now heading all the way out to the outer solar system. Morningstar has now reached its transfer window to Eltos. I say transfer window, I mean, it, Kerbal Alarm Clock said this is when the transfer window was. Probably wasn't exactly the optimum time to launch to Eltos, but that might just be because launching anywhere from Reaper is a real pain because it has such high gravity and <laughs> especially when you're in orbit of one of the moons, figuring out the best time, the best place in the orbit to actually start your burn is really difficult. So it took quite a long time and it turns out even the smallest burn we could do, like only just escaping Reaper's Sphere of Influence, still knocks our apoapsis way up above Elto. So we have to escape from Reaper's Sphere of Influence and then as soon as we get out of it, slow down again to bring that apoapsis back down. And that really meant we had to do quite a lot of rather costly maneuvers. Another problem with Reaper's massive sphere of influence is that, yeah, it takes a, almost a year. It takes 300 days just to get out of it. Uh, so <laughs> I just decided, you know what, I'm going to freeze all of my non-essential personnel. We already froze all of our away team sort of crew, the crew that head down to the planets, but now we're going to freeze Ted. We can do the rest of our maneuvers just using our automated systems, so using our probe core. We're still in communication, direct communication, in fact, with Solitude Ground Control, so the only crew that are going to remain unfrozen now are our scientists. Our six scientists beavering away, working and sifting through all the data that we got from the various different moons of Reaper. And yeah, they've got their work cut out for them because we filled all of them. So <laughs> they're each producing, I believe, about 14 science a day. And they're now going to be doing that for the foreseeable future. Of course, we have all of our recyclers on. We also have our agroponics bays. So we have about three and a half years worth of supplies when being eaten and breathed by these six Kerbals. So they can research stuff for about the next three years and then we'll freeze them as well for the remainder of the journey to Eltos. So once we've done our rather hefty <laughs> correction burn, here we have to actually make two of them uh, but this one's just to mainly bring our apoapsis down and adjust our inclination slightly and then we'll be able to make a second uh, course correction at our ascending node I believe it is uh, which to fully correct our inclination and actually bring us into an encounter with Eltos but the whole journey to Eltos yeah I, I massively underestimated it it's gonna take eight years we're gonna arrive at Eltos just after the Endurance actually arrives at Valentine's so Morningstar they're gonna be out there for a lot lot longer than we initially planned uh, but that's not actually too much of a problem I mean we're going to need a long, long time. I mean, realistically, you'd need a long time to be designing a massive interstellar mission anyway. So I'm not too concerned about it. Anyway, uh, we've now planned our maneuver and it's going to be three years until we get to that massive inclination change. So each year I decided I would go check on Artemis and uh, just grab all of our colony rewards. As I've said in previous episodes with USI, you just get rewards for having a colony in place, depending on which Kerbals are actually in the colony. So every year I decided, yep, I'll go to Artemis, check on Artemis, uh, get the colony rewards and also transmit the science that's been researched on Morningstar. And just keep flipping between them, really. So once again, get our colony rewards. Just check that all our Kerbals are happy and healthy on Artemis. Yep, head back to Morningstar and transmit the science again, rinse and repeat. Uh, three times over three separate years while we're waiting for our manoeuvre to arrive. So yeah, back to Artemis again. I haven't visited Artemis in quite a while. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's another sort of thing. Leaving Artemis running for countless years. Again, it's another really important proof of concept and proof of technology that we need before we even go into Stella. I mean, you can see there, uh, we finally run out of fertilizer for our aquaponics bays on Morningstar and we're starting to run low on supplies. So now we've arrived at our maneuver, we've transmitted our last lot of science. Even though we've still got loads of data to sort through, we've sorted through about half of it, uh, we are going to now have to actually freeze our remaining scientists. So we're going to make this course correction, get ourselves the encounter with Eltos and freeze the crew for the remaining five year journey out to Eltos. We get a rather beautiful succession of shots uh, here. You see, there we go. We have our encounter with Eltos and now it's time to freeze all of our Kerbals and put them away for a long sleep before we get to Eltos. By the time they wake up again, we'll have arrived at Valentine with the Endurance. We'll have photos of 
worlds from another star and they'll be receiving the news as to whether or not we're actually going to be sending Kerbals there. And this mission will be providing a lot of very important data about long-term cryosleep, about exposure to you know, microgravity for extended periods of time, even though of course they do have a centrifuge. But this is a very, very important mission uh, and I think, yeah, it makes a lot of sense to extend the mission, to go out to Eltos, visit the last planet, and as I said, you know, spend a lot more time researching the effects that these long missions are going to have, because the journey out to Valentine, that's going to take over 10 years, so it's all going to be information we are going to need. But with the ridiculous amount of science transmitted back from Morningstar over those three years, we can unlock unified field theory, high density fusion reactions, ultra high energy physics, exotic plasma propulsion, exotic photovoltaic materials, extreme heat management, extreme density fusion reactions, and extreme electrical systems. In fact, we've unlocked all but six techs in the tech tree. However, there are actually three techs in the tech tree that I'm never going to unlock, simply because they unlock technologies that are just far too overpowered and that's quantum gravity which unlocks like a black hole reactor which is just insane and it's not really near future technology that's <laughs> all that viable it's entirely theoretical so yeah no we're not doing that and we're also not getting ftl i remember i promised at the beginning of the series we're not going to get warp drives we're going to do everything with near future fusion propulsion and we're also not going to get extreme fusion rockets because that introduces the buzzard fusion engine which yeah although okay while theoretically possible it basically has infinite delta v and that kind of removes all the challenge entirely we want to do our interstellar mission using the daedalus engine which is a far more theoretically feasible engine uh, but anyway, now we've unlocked all those technologies, uh, we will be arriving at Eltos in the next episode. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. I've been the Bearded Penguin, and I will see you all next time.